Kamen Rider Kuga was meant as a stepping stone for their franchise's return, and luckily it did well enough in numbers so another season was greenlit. The drama was great, the toys sold enough, and women were all over Joe Degir's portrayal as Yusuke Godai. On the surface, the next season seemed similar and the connections were pretty obvious at first. However, Kamen Rider Agito would grow on its own without having to be compared to Kuga. They're meant to be different with more Kamen Riders, more action, and of course, more drama. We start with Trash on a Beach, which may or may not be a sign of quality for the season. For legal purposes, that is a joke. We also see a kid playing with a strange mechanism. Elsewhere, a man named Makoto Hikawa tests out a battle armor called G3, which is based on a certain someone we know. More on that in a bit. At a school, a young man, Shoichi Sugami, delivers books to a teacher, Yoshihiko Misugi. Apparently, Shoichi isn't a very good cook, as you can tell by the teacher's reactions when he says Shoichi's gonna cook dinner tonight. <laughs> That's something I wish we didn't have in common. Misugi is looking after him, since Shoichi has amnesia. Others in the Misugi household is his niece, Mana, and his son, Taichi, who I'm never gonna bring up, but has some pretty funny sarcastic moments. Don't worry, our name drops aren't finished yet because we also meet a swimmer named Ryo Ashihara. He seems pretty normal until he gets a headache and starts to drown. The mechanism from the opening was taken to a research facility and its gears stop moving. Then, a monster kills a civilian and stuffs his corpse into a tree. Um, golden chainsaw for best kill anyone? Hikawa investigates this incident, but another officer named Hojo tells him that this has nothing to do with unidentified life forms. Alright, we gotta get into this. Actual continuity in early Heisei. Well, sort of. It's mostly agreed upon that Kamen Rider seasons exist in the same world, with some exceptions. A weird gray area is with Kamen Rider Kuga and Agito. The monsters in Kuga were designated as unidentified life forms, which is what Hojo just referenced. However, this reference was dropped hard after only a couple of episodes, and is never brought up again. Luckily, TV Asahi did give an official statement on this connection. The gist of their quote is that you can believe Agito is a straight sequel, or a parallel universe. Kuga did happen, and Agito occurs after, but it doesn't have to be a direct continuation. I personally don't think it's that deep. Unidentified life forms are just a quick reference. Besides, TV Asahi's statement included that Kuga fought hard to keep everyone's smiles, so a similar conflict happening almost immediately after might make it seem like his fight was for nothing. It's a nice sentiment, something I wish a certain anniversary season kept. But I digress. Actually, let's have that be the question of the video. What do you guys think about the Kuga and Agito connection? Would you have liked it more if Agito did keep more references to Kuga? Please let me know in the comments below. Back to episode 1. Hikawa runs into a monster so he suits up into Kamen Rider G3. Well, I like the manual transformation. The suit itself is… uh, something. You can see the Kuga influences at least. Hikawa is part of a G3 team along with two others, Ozawa and Omuro. During the fight, another Kamen Rider appears. The monsters call him Agito. The action dies down and a meeting with the police department goes underway. They question who Agito is, though Hikawa notes that he looks like Kuga, to us known as Unidentified Lifeform Number 4. He believes these monsters aren't Grongi, but a new enemy, which is why G3 wasn't able to keep up. Instead of being called unidentified life forms, the police will call them unknowns. As if it wasn't obvious, Shoichi transforms into Agito to fight the unknown, while Mana witnesses it. We also see that Agito has a blue form that can summon a uh, rod. Familiar, and I'll get back to the suit later. Let's see what Ryo's up to. He exits from the hospital and resigns from the swim team. Oh, well, there must be some good reason for it. I'm sure it's just one obstacle getting in the way of his life. Shoichi gets away from his household for a while when Misugi tells Mana about the day he found Shoichi. He was on a beach and all Shoichi had was an envelope. Hikawa investigates Shoichi's house in time for their first real meetup, then an unknown attacks, so they both jump into action. Without letting each other know, of course. Remember that weird mechanism from the beginning? Somehow, in some way, in some mystical fifth dimension that I know nothing about, a baby appears from it. Don't question it, you're not going to get an answer. 
G3 has needed repairs after every battle, so Hojo calls Hikawa unqualified to be its user. They have this rivalry going on, and the tension increases when Hojo says he knows why Hikawa is even allowed to use G3 in the first place. Hikawa was apparently the hero of an incident where he saved several people who were stranded on a ferry called the Akatsuki, except one person disappeared. The Akatsuki incident is why Hikawa is G3, basically so he would keep his mouth shut about it. Ryo and his girlfriend are out on a lovely stroll along a port, as couples do, when an unknown appears. It teleports Ryo to the sky and drops him, but Ryo is able to stop midway, and transforms. His girlfriend runs away frightened. This is why Ryo had to quit the swim team. He's been feeling immense pain from the transformation and now he feels a new kind of pain when his girlfriend says that they shouldn't see each other anymore. Remember that baby I mentioned earlier? It seems like he's already grown into a little boy. Oh, they grow up so fast. The boy latches onto a scientist and tells an unknown not to attack her, or else this happens. Jeez. Despite Ryo being brokenhearted, and broken in general, he finds the will to protect others, even his now ex-lover. He sees an unknown targeting her, and then Ryo transforms. Meet our third writer of the season, Common Rider Gills. We had something mystical with Agito, mechanical with G3, and now something organic with Gills. The suit is very jarring to me, maybe because I feel like riders are generally people with an armor-like appearance, but Gills feels like a monster, not a human, not dissimilar to Shin. Gills' mouthpiece can open up and that's just awesome. I briefly brought up G3's suit. To put it more in depth, I like the idea of a man-made rider suit. Not bionic like Ichigo or Rider Man, but something you have to put on piece by piece to be called a rider. I just wish it didn't look, um, janky? For sure it's the torso bulging out make it seem like Hikawa missed arm and leg day. Agito, on the other hand, is mixed for me. It's a nice evolution of Kuga, adding just a little bit more... flair, I want to say. The colors are cool, the design is clean, though a bit more armor on the legs would have been better. Agito has a couple of forms. Why did I bring it up before? Because he already has them and uses them whenever he wants to. There's no arc or how or why he gets them. Shoichi can just do it. Today is the anniversary of Mana's father's passing. He was murdered a long time ago, so Mana keeps clippings of the news in her room. Shoichi finds them and envisions something, although the weird thing being that Mana can see his memories, and they don't look so good. Mana wants to test out this new power to help Hikawa investigate, and he just goes with it, I guess. One thing leads to another when Mana, Shoichi, Ryo, and Hikawa all cross paths to find one person. Shinohara Psycho. She's a diver where Mana and Shoichi find a pot she gathered with the Agito insignia on it. Ryo knows Psycho because her name appeared on his late father's notebook that was tied to the Akatsuki. And Hikawa still catfights with Hojo. Psycho explains that there are ruins in the lake where she goes diving at. It belonged to an ancient civilization that worshipped a warrior who had the Agito logo. However, Psycho's brother says that she went crazy a year ago due to the Akatsuki incident meaning that the story of the civilization may have been made up. Though it doesn't matter now since she may have known too much and is killed by an unknown. Remember the little boy from earlier? Well, now he's an adult. He got taken in by the police and was admitted to a hospital when a visitor arrives for him. The visitor writes his name as Sugami Sho... No, wait. Sawaki Tetsuya. Oh look, there's a meme of Shoichi and Hikawa sticking their fingers in the mouth of fish. It's how they can tell it's fresh. Yeah, it's still pretty funny with or without context. Mana visits the police station every once in a while to get any updates on her father's murder. She and Hikawa investigate a house when Mana has a flashback of her reading a book about Momotaro and Onigashima. That's a really strange coincidence. <laughs> Hikawa finds a bouncy ball in a VHS tape, and no, the ball isn't the murder weapon. Unfortunately, the tape isn't much help either because it shows static. Weirdly enough, the ball is actually an inside-out one used for tennis, the same kind of ball that Ryo found during his own investigation on someone else. <laughs> oh look, there's a meme of Shoichi using the sympathy card to make Hikawa do his chores for him. So Hojo has been a bit of a jerk ever since he got introduced, and he decides to formulate the Agito capture plan behind Hikawa's back. It gets the approval from the higher up, so Hojo thinks of a way to fight him without using G3. Episode 22, Fateful Showdown. 
Due to some poor timing and miscommunication, Ryo thinks that Agito killed someone close to him. Then Hikawa arrives as G3 and gets the suit absolutely destroyed to the point where we get a helmetless scene. The G3 team look over the footage of the fight. Ozawa assumes that Hikawa is feeling guilty over the G3 suit being broken yet again. But Amuro notes that maybe it isn't Hikawa who's weak, but the suit itself. Ozawa has been gathering data since G3's first deployment. So now, it's time for an upgrade. To the next step of Hojo's Agito capture plan comes a draft he submitted for a new anti-unknown system, which he calls V1. For some reason, the TV Nihon subs make it look like it says VI, as in the Roman numeral 6, but no, it's V1. I got all your comments on that, thank you. Although, Hikawa already has plans for G3X, her next project. Hikawa tests out G3X in a simulation, but even that's too much for him. Hojo scoffs, saying that Hikawa is too weak, so he'll show them what a real system can do. Once Hojo puts on the V1 suit. The reason G3X is so powerful is because Ozawa added a special AI for it to work on its own. But Hikawa is training himself to fight his own way. Ozawa does have a backup plan for someone else to use G3X. Omuro smiles happily. She visits Shoichi because he's always relaxed and knows he won't fight against the system. With that, Hikawa pleads for another chance. The day comes where it's G3X versus Hojo's V1, which looks kinda cool. You might recognize parts of V1 coming from Metal Hero shows. G3X looks awesome too. So big and brutal, you definitely wouldn't want to fight against that. During their test runs, G3X starts pummeling V1 and goes off on its own to fight an unknown. Hikawa pulls out a gigantic gun and is able to kill off the unknown. During one fight, Shoichi falls into a body of water and gets a vision of a woman in white. He knows who this is. It's his sister. He gets visions of an academy, an ocean, a woman on a table. In a similar way, Ryo reaches his own conclusion after investigating some more. He meets more people who are on his father's list that were part of the Akatsuki incident. During another fight, Ryo gets a headache and passes out. One of the men on the list say that they should keep Ryo around until someone named Kino tells them what to do. Oh <laughs> look, Shoichi uses Trinity form for the first time. I guess he just now figured he could press two buttons at the same time. Maybe we weren't supposed to know about it. I gotta ask a rhetorical question here. What do you consider to be artsy? It's a very broad and general term that I can't exactly put a definition on. Well, with Agito being only the second season of the Heisei era, there's bound to be some experimenting. Kuga's fight scenes felt raw, and Agito is about the same, but there are moments where fights are more tightly choreographed. Kuga and Agito's transformation sequences are pretty straightforward. Then we have Ryo and the embodiment of Gills walking in front of a bright light, and Ryo accepting the monster that is Gills. The season has some weird artistic decisions that I don't usually notice in Kamen Rider, such as there being a lot of shaky cam. The writing and pacing feel... off, though in a kind of good way, kind of bad way. The mystery of the Akatsuki is the main driving point for the show. It's why characters are crossing paths and fighting the unknown. The pacing issue comes in when we have several detours, and then detours for those detours, feeling like it's taking forever to get to the next step of solving the mystery. Hojo's Agito capture plan was set up to be this big deal until the police shoot Ryo and he's... fine. Alright, guess it's time to pull out V1, which took a few episodes to get to since the plan was first brought up. The person that Ryo thought Agito killed was someone on his father's list. Our two heroes get mad at each other and then... back to work as usual. As much as I call Hojo a jerk, that's basically all he is until his major plan comes in. I could say the same thing about other characters too, but not in a bad way. Shoichi is a nice enough guy, a bit too naive, but he's happy to just be a maid for his household. Yeah, he's part of the Akatsuki mystery, though he's happy with whether it's solved or not. I actually like that in a protagonist, laid back and serious when he needs to be, especially when fighting the unknown. Hikawa is also serious when he needs to be. He has funny moments when he's taken off guard with comedic timing. Ryo's serious all the time because he almost has to be. Ryo's girlfriend left him, he had to quit his favorite sport, his dad died, and now he has a mystery to solve so he can get some sort of closure. My main point of all of this is me leading up to four words. Yeah, I get it. Ryo and Gil standing side by side with a bright light shining behind them. Yeah, I get it. 
Hojo telling the audience that everything is connected once Shuichi gets his memories of his sister back, even though Hojo was just trying to solve a rope trick. Yeah, I get it. Shuichi and Hikawa are quirky because they stuck their fingers in sightfish. Yeah, I get it. The man who's currently in the hospital by the police because he was deemed too mentally unstable after growing up in just a couple of episodes and killing off an unknown with his thoughts alone, only to turn out to be the mastermind with the typical monologue of, humans are so weak, and then Tetsuya Sawaki arriving to say no you. Yeah, I absolutely 100% get it. I don't claim to get deep into these shows, I just like to watch Kamen Rider and then generally talk about them. So I'm not gonna start saying something like, Oh, the light actually represents Rio's inner darkness, so now he accepts the monster inside him. If you like to do that, then that's great. I like seeing other opinions and them delving into something I didn't notice before. Please keep doing that. But for myself, I just want to talk about men in spandex fighting monsters. So what's the main point on top of the main point I'm trying to make? Episode 28, That Summer Day. In a flashback to a few weeks earlier, Ryo takes care of a runaway kid. They learn from each other with Ryo saying, All you can do is live until the end comes. I don't get it. One of my favorite sayings is that opinions can change. My first go around with History of Agito had me feign anger and impatience. After so much time, I realized that I was looking at this all wrong. In a way, isn't everything artsy? Am I supposed to take this franchise at face value? What's the writer's intention behind every word? I don't know, but the action looks great. That Summer Day is my favorite episode of the season. It takes its time to tell a real focused story. Not everything in his life is terrible. Sometimes it's just one or several bad days. Other times it takes one gentle moment to make everything alright. I've had a few comments before saying that I'm taking the show too seriously, and I've had the same amount of comments saying that I don't know enough to understand the true meaning behind the show. I guess both are valid, but all I care about is a good show with some fun action. Maybe I don't understand the motives behind Shoichi's naivety, but I like seeing Ryo transform. I can probably write an entire essay about the Akatsuki incident, but I'd rather sit down and enjoy the mystery unfold. This show isn't for everyone. It definitely wasn't for me before, and it doesn't have to be. Some people may not like the pacing, others can get past that just for the suits alone. Everyone has their own reasons to enjoy something or not, and it's all valid. Oh look, there's the meme of Shoichi using a frying pan as a tennis racket. Episode 31, A Person's Whereabouts. Mana is at a park, remembering moments of being with her dad. Then she accidentally breaks someone's skateboard with her power. She continues on and gets kidnapped. Mana wakes up in a stranger's bed. They're people that we've seen with Ryo, the ones who brought up a man named Kino. He wanted this group of people to be together because they have similar powers. A new guy named Majina arrives. They discuss how they're all related to the Akatsuki incident, except for one, Mana. But that doesn't matter. The group is happy that they have a place to belong together. Remember Tetsuya? He's been chilling with the emo-looking guy in the hospital all this time. Now he's reaching out to Mana since Ryo has been missing for a while. His body has been floating in a river due to a previous battle, so Tetsuya asks Mana to revive him with her power. Mana wants to stay in the apartment with her own kind, but it appears that people like her are being killed off even faster, causing Mana, Ryo, Hikawa, and Shoichi to cross paths again. A powerful unknown is here, and it's the one that Shoichi remembers from the Akatsuki. Wait, Shoichi was on the Akatsuki? Tetsuya explains to everyone in the apartment that anyone involved with the Akatsuki shares similar fate. They will all be able to transform into an Agito. Not Agito, an Agito. There are species that the unknown are afraid of. Something similar has awakened inside Ryo, though Tetsuya doesn't want to give away why just yet. And frankly, I don't really know why either. After a couple of fights, Hikawa witnesses Ryo de-transform. Plus, Ryo and Shoichi now know of each other's transformations too. They both get their misunderstandings out of the way, and Shoichi is happy that he now knows someone who can transform like him. An unknown attacks Majina, but Shoichi is too hurt physically and mentally from a previous fight. Ryo and Hikawa try to fight an unknown, though they get defeated just as fast as Shoichi, who's lost confidence in himself. Ryo wishes he was normal too, but doesn't feel sorry for himself. Shoichi should be happy that he's in a warm place and has people who worry about him. Mana makes Shoichi a salad and tries to cheer him up too, asking why Shoichi never fights for himself. He takes the salad, and... (laughs) 
tokusatsu when even salad needs an insert theme <laughs> oh yeah actually the music let's get to that I really like this theme. I still have it in my top 10 favorite openings. It's mystical and laid back, but strong at the same time. The start of those strings with vocals coming in and then the guitar making its way to a solo, it's great. Then there's a variation of the theme coming a bit later called the 24.7 version. I tend to prefer the originals, but this one's alright. The added guitar to the intro is an interesting choice. Our main insert theme is called Believe Yourself. Not the biggest fan, though it gets the job done. I think there's something about the theme that just doesn't make me want to listen to it after the first go round. Probably because I've noticed it play way more than any other non Agito insert theme, but I digress. Oh yeah, here we go. This is one of my favorite inserts and I don't even know why. I think it's the emotion of... something. It's catchy? Years later and I still have a tough time explaining why I love certain pieces of music. Just listen to Deep Breath. It's really good. Right, so... I wanted to have a detour so I wouldn't have to talk about what happens right after the salad scene. Shoichi gets his confidence back and arrives on scene to help his fellow riders. Then Shoichi summons a new belt and transforms into Burning Agito. With it, he can defeat the unknown in one punch. I will get to the suit later. On one night, Majina and Ryo get trapped by an unknown, until Mystery Man steps in. Majina refers to him as Kino who has the ability to transform into another Agito. You know, I find it weird that he's officially called Kamen Rider Another Agito. It sounds almost as weird as Kamen Rider The Bee. I'm sure the intention was that he would be named just Another Agito, like how Rider Man isn't Kamen Rider Rider Man, he's just Rider Man. I mean, if Kamen Rider Another Agito is so good, then where's Kamen Rider Another Agito too? I personally prefer the name Agito Squared. Is that not enough Agito for you? How about Agito Cubed? Agito Infinity? You want more Agito? I think everyone's an Agito. You're an Agito. I'm an Agito but Kino is just another Agito, another, another Agito, another Agito, Agito, Agito. Hey everyone, as always, if you liked the video, then I'd be forever grateful if you could support the channel either by leaving a like or joining as a member. You'll get some neat perks like watching videos early, being able to send in a request, and access to some secret Discord server stuff. Let's get back to it. In a meeting, Hojo brings up how the police can't rely on G3X forever, especially since civilian casualties have stayed the same. Luckily, Ozawa has been working on a new project, one which anyone can use, called G3 Mild. Omuro offers to test it out and Ozawa agrees. After all, anyone can use it. An unknown appears and Shuichi fights it with burning form. G3X and G3 Mild are deployed, though Omoto passes out after only one punch and a helmet shot. Then G3X's batteries deplete. G3X has batteries? So Omoto replaces it with his own. Still in burning form, Shuichi looks towards the sun and... <laughs> becomes Agito Shining Form. I'll get to that in burning form later. Afterwards, Ozawa says that G3 Mild is getting dropped as the unknown are getting stronger so the police require a stronger system. She does have plans for something bigger than G3X, but no one must see it in its current state. She leaves the team's trailer and a woman sneaks in, ready to steal its plans. Which leads us to the movie Project G4. There's a facility that houses people with superpowers, but it's attacked by the unknown. Two kids are able to escape when they meet with Shoichi, Mana, and Ryo. By the way, there's this really awesome Gills transformation. <laughs> it leads to Ryo and Shoichi fighting off more unknowns on a harbor, when suddenly... <laughs> meet our first movie exclusive Dark Rider of the Heisei era, Kamen Rider G4. Its user, Shiro Mizuki, is a stern man playing by the rules and fighting for what he thinks is the right path for more power. 
Ozawa recognizes the G4 suit as the one she created, but a woman named Risa Fukami stole the plans in order to mass produce the suit. However, a major flaw starts to make itself apparent once a horde of unknown attack their facility. During this invasion, Shoichi uses shining form and Ryo gains a power up in the form of exceeded gills. Meanwhile, G3X and G4 are having a battle to the death, leaving Hikawa helmetless and G4 showing something sinister. Much like how G3X had a powerful AI that caused Hikawa to strain himself, the G4 system has an even more powerful AI that could prove fatal if overused. Unfortunately, Mizuki's blind lust for power caused a G4 suit to take control entirely and leave his lifeless body to be used by the AI. That's... Oh, oh my gosh. Well, Hikawa destroys the G4 system and we have a happy ending. The specialist G3 Mild is called a new transformation. It could be considered kind of like a prologue. It gives some backstory on Shoichi's time being found on the beach along with G3 Mild's plans being groundwork for Ozawa's next project. The movie is called Project G4, and it actually isn't that bad. It's very pretty to watch in high quality and the extra budget leads to some great action. G3X vs G4 is especially brutal, plus Gilza's first fight with an unknown and the fight in the harbor are gorgeous. One of the many writer trends that started with Agito is having at least one movie to supplement the season, along with having movie-exclusive writers. Antagonists that appear in these movies are usually referred to as dark writers, and I hope I don't have to explain why. G4 has a suit that looks a lot like G3X, and that kinda makes sense. G3X being the most powerful suit so far, the next project most likely wouldn't need much of a revision. Shiro Mizuki as a character though, uh, I'll give him a pass. This is the first movie we've gotten in a while, so the antagonist most likely isn't going to be a game changer, so I don't mind if he's just the general lust for power type. Plus, I think it works as a rival to Hikawa. The idea of having G4's AI just snapping your neck to take over your body is terrifying, and I love it. Oh, I almost forgot the movie's ending theme. It's called Jikenda. Guys, I love Agito's vocal themes. They're not the most inspiring or hopeful sounding songs to me, but they fit the feeling of Agito as a whole. Jiken Da is another one of my favorite songs of the season. It's great. Though again, the movie isn't bad. I'd even say it's worth a watch whether you're an Agito fan or not. It's fun. Back to the show with episode 36, The Fourth Man. Another Agito's user is Kino Kaoru. He knows about everything that happened on the Akatsuki, but he's more focused on the now rather than the past. Currently, he's suspicious that Ryo can transform, despite not being on the Akatsuki in the first place. Kino has been gathering people with power like Majina so they can save other Akatsuki members. What's interesting about Kino is that he's a surgeon, so he has the morality to save people as a doctor and as an Agito. Oh, sorry. The more interesting part is that Kino isn't tied to any hospital. He's a wanderer. We're told by another doctor that Kino's license was revoked after being in an accident that took his younger brother's life. Kino was about to lose his right arm but was forced to replace it with his brother's, so the other doctor saw him unfit to continue medical work. Shoichi's bike breaks down so Mana arrives on her little bicycle and Kino happens to be driving by so he stops to help them out. Although, Mana is scared of him, seeing visions of him in the snow with his brother. She feels something off about him. At the apartment, Majina's in the shower. His body is feeling strange, so he believes it's a sign that he's becoming an Agito. Kino tries to drown him, saying that he's the only Agito the world needs. Majina pushes him away and runs towards Ryo. Kino does want to protect humans, but only by himself. Hikawa arrives on the scene and sees Kino untransform. However, Hikawa recognizes Kino from the Akatsuki, and practically fanboys after thinking that Kino has been the Agito he's been allying with this whole time. Though that's kind of like a Sonic and Shadow the Hedgehog moment because another Agito and Shoichi's Agito looked nothing alike, but whatever. By the way, this is the episode where Shoichi gets shining form proper in the season. It comes out of nowhere, and makes no sense, but I won't go off, I guess. Oh right, you still probably want to know what I think about the suits. Well, I actually do like Burning Form's colors. It acts very beast-like, and I love that, especially coming from the mystical part of Agito. And Shining Form, I think, looks absolutely gorgeous. I love those colors, and of course, it is shiny. I kind of wish Shining Form was actually the base form, but I, I don't think you can go further than this. Either way, I do like the suits, and I like the action that comes from them. 
I just really don't like how they come out in the story. And again, I won't go off, I guess. After a misunderstanding, Hojo interrogates Shoichi about being in Agito, to which Shoichi immediately replies that he is. Hojo thinks he's being screwed with, so he tries hypnotizing Shoichi instead. It seems to be working as Shoichi thinks he sees a culinary school, his sister, who committed suicide. He's running late to meet with someone. He boards a ferry, which is about to enter a storm. Ozawa's had enough and talks with Shoichi privately. He really did mean it when he said he's Agito. Shoichi is now officially recognized by the police and is allowed to continue doing whatever it is Agitos do. Though Hikawa is really excited to finally see Agito's true identity. I know this is an abrupt way to say this, but I gotta bring it up. Tetsuya makes it so Majina transfers his power over to Ryo in baby form. I still don't get it. Kino starts to go even crazier and attempts to take mana. Hikawa and Shoichi try to fight him off, though Kino has gotten more powerful. And so has Ryo. He arrives on scene and properly debuts Exceeded Gills. Yeah, it's an awesome power-up. After Kino gets beaten up and given a stern talking to, he turns into a good guy, I guess. Here's a quick scene of Hikawa being nervous to talk to Shoichi after finding out he's Agito. Meanwhile, Hojo investigates Kino's house due to some suspicious behavior. Inside, he finds a letter addressed to someone named Yukina. Hojo shows Mana the letter so she can do her psychic power thing. She has a vision of a boy in black and a boy in white. We're about to reach the endgame, so it's exposition time! With Ryo and Hikawa officially introducing each other for the first time, our three main writers are told Kino's backstory about how he saved himself by cutting off his brother's arm, though now Shoichi wants all of them to start an Agito club. <laughs> okay, that's adorable. For the viewers, we're shown more about Tetsuya. He killed the first Agito born into this world, that person being Yukina. So the emo guy in the hospital says it caused Tetsuya to become loyal to him and now wants him to kill every Agito. More of Shoichi's memories return about the Akatsuki. The first time he boarded the ferry, he met a few familiar faces like Majina, but they didn't know each other at that point. The ferry floats into a storm when Shoichi finds a corpse. Panic ensues, everyone talking about their own problems, though Shoichi is sad that his sister committed suicide recently. He pockets an envelope and a man in white appears before him. The man says he'll awaken a power within Shoichi to save people from the unknown that's on the ferry. Shoichi transforms for the first time but ends up getting beaten up and punched off the boat. The unknown presents itself to everyone on the Akatsuki. They all have the potential to become an Agito because of the man in white being on the boat. Until their power is awakened, the unknown will spare them. Just then, Hikawa arrives to help rescue the remaining Akatsuki members. The envelope Shuichi had was a letter from his sister, Yukina Sawaki. Kino takes a look at it but can't read the language that's on the letter. However, Mana can with her ability. A long time ago, there was a battle between a Lord of Light and a Lord of Darkness. The darkness won, but the light spreads the last of his power towards humans. They'll never know of this battle, but their full potential will one day awaken. Currently, the Lord of Darkness is in the hospital meeting with who we now know as Tetsuya Sawaki. However, this man changed his name after Shoichi took his letter and his identity by accident. Although, I'll keep calling them Tetsuya and Shoichi respectively to avoid confusion. Tetsuya was Yukina's boyfriend until she committed suicide. Oh, you probably want to know about Mana's vision of Shoichi and her father meeting. Well, I think I'll leave that for you to find out on your own. It connects a couple of people together in a way that I want you to be surprised by. The Lord of Darkness makes his move. He steps out of the hospital and is preparing to take back Agito's power. One by one, he takes on Kino, Ryo, and even Shoichi to steal their ability to transform. However, G3X is a man-made machine created to help humanity. So with Hikawa's help, Shoichi goes through the Lord of Darkness's barrier and literally punches God in the face, returning their powers. At the apartment, Majina tells Kino his dream of wanting to become a doctor, just like him. Kino smiles, and so does Ryo, until he realizes that Kino Kaoru has stopped moving. So one of my many criticisms of the season is the pacing. I'm not going to go on forever like I did in a previous version of this video, but I think my point is still valid. 
I'm personally invested in characters like Ryo and Kino. Shoichi and Hikawa are fine protagonists for sure. Even Mana and Hojo are fine enough people to follow around and be interested in. I like how Mana ties into the story without events seeming too convenient. The weird feeling I get is that you'd kinda expect the main villain to be facing off against our heroes directly in these last few episodes. Instead, we get a flash forward to a month later? The Lord of Darkness nor his unknowns have appeared so the police decide to disband the G3 team. Ryo decides to get a part-time job and Shoichi becomes a chef through some connections. The Lord of Darkness has been building up revenge to destroy humanity and start over. Then the writers group up to kill God. In one of the most I get it moments ever from the show, the Lord of Darkness says that he doesn't understand humans. He revived Tetsuya to kill Agitos but instead was betrayed. A leaf falls. The Lord of Darkness disappears and Tetsuya dies for real. One year later, Omuro trains a new G5 unit. Hikawa is a detective, Ozawa is a professor in London and might be falling for Hojo. Majina becomes Mana's tutor, Ryo rides off into the sunset with a puppy, and Shuichi is the head cook of his own restaurant called the Yagito. Thank you TV Nihon for subbing this awesome series. Oh but wait! You want to know the backstory of the unknowns, right? Well, about that. In the beginning, there was Teos, the overlord of darkness. He created seven archangels, the Moraku, and the Earth. Teos created animals in the image of the Moraku, and he created humans in the image of himself. And the world was good. It was a paradise. As time passed, humans populated the Earth. Since humans were created in the image of Teos, they began to believe that they were superior to Teos' archangels. Humans began to eat and enslave animals, which were created in the image of the Moraku. Enraged by the humans' actions, the archangels told Teos that they will not bow down to humans, and eventually, will kill them all. Teos did not allow this, but the angels attacked anyway. A war broke out between the Moraku and the humans. One of Teos' archangels, called Proms, sympathized with the humans and betrayed the other archangels. Proms fell in love with a human and had a child. This child grew up to be called Gills, and would lead humans into war against the Moraku. The war ended with the Moraku victorious. In his dying breath, Proms gave his power to the humans. This power would allow them to transform into Agito, a powerful warrior. The Archangels wanted to completely wipe out all humans. The angels flooded the earth for 40 days, but Teos created an ark that spared some humans and animals. Why have you saved these humans? asked the angels. You have sinned, and so have I, replied Teos. And with this, Teos, along with his angels, were sealed away until humans were able to obey Teos once again. The Ark opened. The humans were led by Agito and G3 so that they could populate the Earth once more. G3 was a symbol that humans would one day be able to create weapons and be able to fight for themselves. Agito was a symbol that maybe one day, humans and Agito could live in peace. But before the war between Morocco and humans, there was one human tribe that called for help from the Lords. The lords would deliver a man named Riku, who was given the power to transform into a warrior called Kuga. But that is a story for another day. For those who don't know, this video is a remake of my previous History of Agito. Much like History of Kuga, I rewrote the script and edited it from the ground up. I remade them, and hopefully Ryuki, due to feeling outdated not being the quality I liked, and to avoid content ID that Toei loves to look at my channel for. I often bring up how opinions change over time, and that's not much more blatant than revisits of older seasons. Before, I tried a bit too hard at some parts as I was still searching for my own niche. In the present day, I'm definitely going to be more fair with this review. I've been pushing myself for more positivity, so let's start with one negative and the rest will be good critiques. To me... Agito has one main fatal flaw that breaks the season of all enjoyment I had. Timing. The timing of when certain events happen just feel... wrong. Kuga had a slow pace but it was enjoyable throughout since the timing of its own events were consistent. Agito feels like it only has a very small handful of events with nothing of interest in between to keep me invested. And the timing of those events happen almost too close together so now it feels as if three-fourths of the season were one big dull moment. The main event I'm talking about is the exposition of basically everything being explained when it's too late. 
The Akatsuki incident was fine when it got explained, but bring Kino in during the last third, the reveal of who the Lord of Darkness is, Shoichi's and Tetsuya's true backstories, more Agito starting to appear, Hojo and the police investigation was getting more complex, to G3 teams getting their own side plot about Hikawa leaving, the last four episodes centering on Shoichi and Ryo's relationship getting sour due to some unknowns, it's just too much that should have been spread around the whole season, not the last third. I'm not saying it's too complex for me to understand, I'm saying that Agito didn't know what to do until near the end, which of course isn't a good thing. The story being told this way seemed like it was being bloated for the sake of it. Considering the main writer of the season is Toshika Nui, I think the problem becomes more apparent. He can write some pretty good love stories and tragic characters like he did with Jetman. I can praise the writing for characters like Tetsuya, Kino, and Ryo, but the day-to-day -day stories are another thing. Besides, that's all I can really praise Ryo for because his actor is yet another thing I won't go into. Anui will later go on to write a couple future writer seasons and those are quite good in my opinion. Well, one of them is at least. For legal purposes, that is a joke. Please do not comment saying that you absolutely love the other season, so I'm wrong for it automatically. I get it. Of course I'm not putting all the blame on Inoue himself. Making a show has a lot of components to it, especially behind the scenes when we probably won't know about them. Inoue still has to get the approval and okay from the higher ups to say, yeah, this is the story we'll follow up with. Although the story they did follow up with is, uh, yeah, yeah, um, they didn't like it. The last thing I'll say about the timing are the power-ups that seemingly come out of nowhere. Like I said, burning and shining form are gorgeous suits. I love them, but how they appear is just... wrong. Burning is acquired when Shoichi starts finding more confident in himself. Yeah, alright, sure, I'll give that a pass. It fits his story and he earned it even if I think it was at the wrong time. Shining form, however... why? You could say that it was earned because it's growth and it's cool to just have a power up without needing a big arc for it. To which I say, it came two episodes after burning and those episodes didn't have Shoichi doing much in the first place. Want to know how he got shining? He stood outside. I've said before that I can be objective, but I do have biases that just come naturally with growing up. While I do like how modern Kamen Rider tells their stories, I appreciate what comes with older seasons, whether it's certain cinematic techniques, the more slower dramatic pacing, and yes, that even includes some rather outdated ideas. I'm fine with all of that. It's what comes with the territory and I know what I'm getting myself into. For subjectivity, I don't think Agito tells a story all that well. Normally, that wouldn't matter if great characters can balance that out. The problem is that Agito does want to tell a story. It's blatantly obvious with how much the Akatsuki mystery is brought up and how characters are seemingly trying to do... anything. Some semblance of a continuing arc is happening. But the key phrase here is, it doesn't matter. I mean that in several ways, actually. For one, it didn't matter to Shoichi whether he found answers or not, even with his memories back. He was like, that's cool, now back to cooking. When everyone else finally figured out what happened with the Akatsuki, it was more like, okay, back to fighting the lords. Then that feeling gets transferred over to me. Okay, that's fine, now I feel like my time was wasted since it feels like it didn't matter. Kamen Rider Agito has the highest viewer rating out of any other Heisei Rider season with an 11.67%. Of course, that's because the early 2000s were a different time. Declining ratings in the modern day is mostly attributed to the switch to digital media and streaming, rather than waking up early on Sunday mornings. However, numbers and any kind of margin must mean something. Obviously, I didn't grow up in Japan to know the early 2000s culture, so I can only speculate about what I found at the time. Mothers tuned in to watch Kuga simply for Joe Odagiri, which led to more emphasis on handsome men as part of the main cast. Yeah, Showa era had handsome men too, but there was more of a focus here. Now, I don't normally point fingers at bad acting because for the most part, Tokusatsu is a starting point for most actors, so I can cut them some slack. However, I could tell a bit more than before that some of the acting here is... Well, I think you'll get what I'm saying. 
Although some of the viewership can still be attributed to the main cast like before, older viewers did like the drama too, as there was a lot more individual character conflict here than in Kuga. Kids would enjoy Agito because they got to see the writer have some nice action in each episode, even if sometimes it felt out of place. Currently, I do know people who enjoy Agito for all those reasons and more. Sometimes I feel like nostalgia plays into that. I won't get into nostalgia or recency bias, but there are just a couple of other reasons to enjoy the show. I'm emphasizing they're not the only reasons, just more to think about. Now for some positivity. The characters are awesome, the G3 team are part of Saul, the squad of anti-unidentified lifeforms, and I love each one. Hikawa isn't in Ichijo 2.0, but dang it, he tries and that's good enough for me. The G3 X arc is one of my favorites because despite getting it, the arc isn't over as Hikawa has to continue training or else the AI will take over. That's amazing, and a way that arc continues into Project G4 when Hikawa has to decide to fight for himself when discussing the possibilities of G4. Omuro is a bit of a goofball, but he has his heart in the right place. I would have liked it if there was more of him, though he works fine enough as a member of the team. Ozawa is great. I wish she was the designated rider girl over Mana, but that's alright. Ozawa gets a lot of screen time and definitely feels like an integral part of the team, outside of creating weapons for them of course. Kino Kaoru could have been better. He did come a bit too late into the story and he goes insane literally the episode after he makes his debut. If he hung around earlier and was given more hints into his backstory, then his turn would have been more impactful for me. I do like him though, and his story is still sad. I didn't want to see him go, though this won't be the last time he'll appear within this franchise. Man, I really wish I could say more about him, but coming in so late to the story hurts his character a lot more than it should have. He's there as a cool guy, then goes crazy as soon as he's introduced. Then he's gone. Alright. Still... Kino is pretty Kino. Ryo would have been one of my favorite writers ever, if not for personal reasons. His tragic story is just so heart-wrenching and that's compared to every other sad character that Anui will write. Well, I say sad, but Ryo pushes anyway, making him commendable. Despite everything he's lost, he accepts his fate and continues fighting alongside Shoichi to defeat the unknown. There's a bit of Jekyll and Hyde to him as he unleashes gills to go ballistic during fights. Then the human side of Ryo investigates the Akatsuki incident on his own with empathy towards those that were affected. I also think it's cute how Mana casually goes over to his apartment to ask for help when Shoichi is in trouble and he's like, Again? Ha, ah, fine. <laughs> I love that. Speaking of Mana, she's good. I mean, she's around a lot more than I expected and even has a handful of episodes centered on her story with her dad. Again, I'll leave those for you to watch. She's a big part of the mystery and she helps out Shoichi quite a bit. Mana is usually the one to have Shoichi along to search for the incident's clues and she pushes him to be better. Whether there's a smile on her face or not, Mana is there to help. And luckily her actress will appear in Kamen Rider again soon. Shoichi might be my least favorite of our main group of writers in Agito, but I don't think he's bad. He's almost literally a blank slate and then grows as we learn more about him. Amnesia may be one of the most overused tropes out there, and Agito doesn't add anything substantial to it, but Shoichi being naive is one reason that makes me enjoy him. In some ways, he's more of a Gary Stu than a certain other main protagonist, though Shoichi's naivety is what makes him stand out. He's very helpful and of course, heroic, along with having some quirks like that fish thing that I still don't understand. You know what, the more I think about it, I think I do like Shoichi. He's certainly not in my top 5 or even top 10, but he's still great. Can I also say that Shoichi having a restaurant is a fantastic character arc for him? I love that. Did I talk enough? I think it's been an hour. Let's get into my final thoughts. Looking back, this season wasn't as bad as I remember. While I think the storytelling is abysmal, the characters made up a lot of it for me. The action is still on par and the journey to the end might be a bit rough, but it's not the worst thing ever. In the end, I just feel more neutral. To me, Kamen Rider Agito is just okay, though slightly leaning towards negative. With all that being said, I'll see you guys next time when we try to fight to survive with Kamen Rider Ryuki. Tateka.